Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're so delighted that you've decided to join us. We hope you've had a chance to be with us before. In case you haven't, this is a program in which we studied the Sabbath School lessons prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And in this group, we're doing it a little in advance so that you might share in some of our ideas when you study with your people. This lesson is the fourth, I'm sorry, the third in a series on witnessing and evangelism. It's entitled Spiritual Gifts for Evangelism and Witnessing. It's for study on April 21 of 2012. And before we begin, I'd like to suggest that we bow our heads together and ask the Holy Spirit to guide us. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for the many ways in which you have blessed us and guided us and, and taught us through your scriptures. Now as we talk about the ways in which you would like to use those gifts which you've given us for the benefit of others, may we see it clearly and may we present it clearly, clearly for the benefit of those who might be listening is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, this lesson is primarily dealing with a very important question of spiritual gifts. We've all heard of those if we've done much New Testament reading and how they might be related to witnessing and evangelism. And of course, the first question would be, do you know what your spiritual gifts are? How do you find out? Could we have spiritual gifts that are not being used? Do you know yours? I do. Okay. I think I, I at least I is have an idea. his? I don't know. Maybe let him. Will, will each of you speak for yourself? I have a, <clears throat> I have a natural knack for teaching, and in my in my specialty in terms of teaching is trying to take things that are a little bit complicated, maybe scientific, maybe religious, and trying to explain them in very simple language. And I'm constantly trying to teach the people I teach to do that as well. And this, is, this applies to the way I practice medicine. You know, it's very easy for young doctors to come in and say, you should da-da-da, and they launch into some a whole, launch of, whole bunch of medical garbage that the patient has not a clue what they're talking about. And they say, you know, you probably ought to say it like this. You, know, you need to eat more vegetables. <laughs> Whatever it is. That's what I'm talking about. Okay? Mm -hmm. I think that's a spiritual gift. Put the lime in the coconut. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, of course, has rightly emphasized the gift of prophecy. And Paul suggests that that's one of the main, most important gifts. We've also spent a lot of money and time dealing with healing. Is it possible that we haven't spent as much time as we should on the other spiritual gifts? Maybe we're well, not taking them seriously enough. Aren't those two spiritual gifts of God himself, one characteristic that we know God is God is that he can foretell the future, which is prophecy, mm -hmm. and Jesus was a healer. Mm -hmm. So those are very good spiritual gifts to have. Yeah, no, no, no question about it. Well, what about the others? They're probably good too. What are the others? Can you lift off some well, others? Well, yeah. Prophecy and healing, I mean, that's the obvious ones. Yeah. What are the other ones? Is there, there a list? is there a list somewhere? Yes, there is. Um, and I don't know whether you just go ahead and... and let, well, let's, let's go ahead and read them. Um, I, we'll go first to 1 Corinthians 12. We probably ought to start with um, verse 6. There are different abilities to perform service, but the same God gives ability to all for their particular service. The Spirit's presence is shown in some way in each person for the good of all. The Spirit gives one person a message full of wisdom. Maybe wisdom is a gift. While to another person, the same Spirit gives a message full of knowledge. One and the same Spirit gives faith to one person, while another, to another person he gives the power to heal. The Spirit gives one person the power to work in miracles, to another the gift of speaking God's message, and to yet another the ability to tell the difference between gifts that come from the Spirit and those that do not. To one person he gives the ability to speak in strange tongues, and to another he gives the ability to explain what is said. But it is one and the same Spirit who does all this as he wishes. He gives a different gift to each person. So there's a whole bunch of them. Yeah, but those are very exotic. Do you uh, see those right now? Is that wrong with exotic gifts? Well, I w I'd like to know some examples today where you can point to and say, he's got that gift of healing, 
He's got the gift of miracles. I just talked about a church spending a lot of money and time on healing. Well, yeah, okay, but that's, um, was that the kind of healing that they were talking about back then? Well, let's look at another list. Um, let's start with Ephesians chapter 4. Let's start with verse 11. It was he who gave gifts, so clearly we're talking about gifts. He appointed some to be apostles. Another word for an apostle, that's someone who was sent out. That's the Greek. The, the Latin is missionary. Mm -hmm. Okay, apostles are missionaries. Others to be prophets. A prophet is someone who speaks on behalf of another person, an ambassador perhaps. We talked about being amb ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Others to be evangelists, others to be pastors and teachers. He did this to prepare all God's people for the work of Christian service. Here's another verse which says, the work of, the, of these gifts is to prepare all of us for what? For service, for ministry, right? In order to build up the body of Christ. Very clear what, what the purpose of this is supposed to be. Um, Romans 12, starting with verse 6. So we are to use our different gifts in accordance with the grace that God has given us. If our gift is to speak God's message, there's one gift, we should do it according to the faith that we have. If it is to serve, we should serve. If it is to teach, we should teach. If it is to encourage others, we should do so. Whoever shares with others should do it generously. Whoever has authority should work hard. Whoever shows kindness to others should do it cheerfully. So, notice that every one of these lists is a little different. And there are others. Other, and maybe not quite so blatant, but there are other lists of gifts. So these gifts... It looks like some people have more emphasis on some gifts than others. I mean, it sounds like everybody should have some, some, some aspect of all of them, but some of them, I mean, a person may be more intense on one yeah. than the others. And so. there, there are people who, who apparently are gifted in several areas, have more than one spiritual gift. One list you read was position, like apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastors, teachers. Those were actual positions. The other two lists that you read were characteristics of those positions. Wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, um, speak God's news, uh, discernment between good and bad, um, service, teach, encourage, share, work hard, show kindness. I'm curious about the tongue, and you had mentioned in there tongue, and then the ability to explain. Yeah. And that's speaking of... Uh, we're we're going to talk a lot more about that later. Okay. It's okay. interesting that, and let me just mention this point, it's interesting that Paul talks about the gifts in chapter 12, the one list we just read, and then he goes on and talks some more about it, and then he follows with the love chapter in, in, in chapter 13. Then he goes to chapter 14, 1 Corinthians 14, where he talks about apparently a misuse of spiritual gifts mm. and how it shouldn't be done. Okay. So the, one of the questions we, we want to talk about at some point is why that particular sequence? Here are the gifts. We should all love each other. Here's what happens when you mess up. The gift in and of itself mm -hmm. is not adequate. No. Uh, as in Christ Object Lessons. Learning, talents, eloquence, every natural or acquired endowment may be possessed. That's, that's the gifts. Mm -hmm. But without the presence of the Spirit of God, no heart will be touched, no sinner won to Christ. On the other hand, if they are connected with Christ, if the gifts of the Spirit are theirs, the poorest and most ignorant of his disciples will have a power that will tell upon hearts. God makes them a channel for the outworking of the highest influence in the universe. Mm -hmm. The reference again? Christ Object Lessons 328. Okay. What about, what about a preacher that gives boring sermons and another preacher that actually gives interesting sermons and you can actually listen to the whole thing. Um, <laughs> should, does one have more gift than the other? And if the awesome. other guy doesn't have the gift, why is he even doing it? Uh, yeah. It depends on the content. 
if he's given a fluff sermon that, that tugs at the heartstrings and you listen and, and it's that. If the other one is a boring sermon because the Spirit of God is being laid out in the way that it should be, that may be a far better sermon. So Just, you're, you're saying that a boring person probably hasn't put enough work in his sermon and that would make it better? I'm saying that a good sermon is not necessarily one that titillates the, the feelings. Yeah, but you're still listening. Not the same as that's your right. Sermon. I know, but that wasn't my point. The point wasn't a entertaining sermon, as as such. But there are some sermons that are just plain boring. No matter how hard you listen to it, you just you drift away, off. Going. That what person is and, and is working in an area where he does not have a gift. But well, maybe he <laughs> maybe well, that's he's obvious. A pastor that that has a gift with his parishioners, and they'll put up with a boring sermon because he has gifts in him, other areas. He has other gifts. And then it may okay. not be boring to your neighbor. <laughs> yeah, what's well, boring to me? <laughs> it's boring to me too. Yeah, um, <laughs> I once heard about two teachers. One of them was a genius. And the students couldn't follow him at all. He would just fly through stuff, and it would all seemed so obvious to him. He just like this, and the students are, <laughs> yep. you know. And there was another guy, you know. You wonder if his IQ was a hundred. He would work so hard to prepare his classes, and he would get up there and he would struggle. But by the time he had explained it all, I mean everybody in the class had it. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, there there are other factors that are involved here. Um, anyway, <laughs> let, 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 let's, let, let me ask a very pertinent question now. Do we, those of us here right now, do we believe that every Christian has been gifted by the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. Sure. Do they all know that they have been gifted? Well, that's the next question. And are, they, are they using those gifts? And if they're not using them for building up the body of Christ, are they wasting their gift? Absolutely. But if someone has been told all their life that you need to have the gifts of teaching and preaching, and those are spiritual gifts. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I know that a number of years ago we had a Bible study in our home with a bunch of women who were moms. Mm -hmm. That's what we were. Mm -hmm. And we talked about spiritual gifts, and it was an amazing day because the group could see a gift in someone else mm -hmm. that that person couldn't see in themselves. Mm -hmm. And having a group like that was wonderful. I mean, I discovered I had gifts that I had no idea I had, and I've worked on those ever mm -hmm. since. Well, here's an example. Here's an example from the Bible. It's a, an interesting little passage. It's found in Acts chapter 13. If you have a Bible, we always encourage you to, to join us to make sure we're not misleading you. Now, my translation is the Good News Bible, which I like very much. And the church at Antioch, now this is Antioch in Syria, there were some prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called the Black, Lucius from Cyrene, Menean, who had been brought up with Herod, the governor, and Saul. And this, of course, was the one who would become Paul. While they were serving the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said to them, we don't know exactly how he did that, set apart from me Barnabas and Saul to do the work which I have called them, to which I have called them. They fasted and prayed, placed their hands on them, and sent them off. Having been sent by the Holy Spirit, Barnabas and Saul went to Seleucus, Seleucia and sailed from there at the island of Cyprus, etc. And, and Paul's missionary journeys were, were launched. Doesn't becoming a Christian allow God to put the Holy Spirit into you and like God has a plan for your life and it allows God to work His plan uh, to make your life better and what He created you to be as if you don't become a Christian, God has a harder time working through you? Yeah. So in a nutshell, what did you just say? I just said that here is a, you know, we've talked about, I, I talked a little while ago about the church that I was a member of for a while that was really on fire. Mm -hmm. Here was a church that apparently was really on fire in, in apostolic times. And uh, if you went on, you find out that that's the place where people were first called Christians. 
-hmm. And it wasn't, it wasn't because everybody thought they were wonderful, it was because they were making fun of them. There's a, look, at here's those funny people who are following a dead man. And you also know? God set those two aside and said, I have a mm -hmm. job for you to do. Yeah. And they were, the, they were some of the firebrands there, and God says, okay, you've been here long enough, you've got the rest of the church on fire, now you need to move on and start some fire somewhere else. So, uh, what about that? How do we get to know if we have spiritual gifts, and if we have spiritual gifts, what they are, how we can expand on them or, or use them? Well, there has to be some sort of progress in their use, yes. wouldn't you think? If yeah. nothing's happening, maybe you're, you don't have a gift there. But look, look at three or four verses, five or six or whatever here, and we're going to go through them quickly here, that talk to us about what's going on. John 16, verse 8, And when he comes, talking about the Holy Spirit, he will prove to the people of the world that they are wrong about sin and about what is right and about God's judgment. So there's a clue about some of the things that they might be talking about. And look at verse 13 in that same chapter. When, however, the Spirit comes, he who, who reveals the truth about God, his main purpose is to reveal the truth about who? God. About God. He will lead you into all truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but he will speak on, of what he hears and will tell you of things to come. That's the kind of witness we're talking about here. Look at Acts 1.8. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be filled with power and you will be witnesses for me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Do we need the Holy Spirit to come on us? And why did he choose to come on those people? We just read Acts 13, 4, having been sent by the Holy Spirit, Barnabas and Saul went to Seleucia and sailed from there to the island of Cyprus. And finally, Romans 8, 11, if the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from death lives in you, then he who raised Christ from death will also give life to your mortal bodies by the presence of his Spirit in you. I think what Myra's group did was fabulous. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe in a church they should make a big sign and they should list all these gifts that you listed. Wisdom, knowledge, hospitality, mm -hmm. kindness, and have people look at the list and then the pastor say, okay, just sort of like a Girl Scout or a Boy Scout badge, which one of these gifts do you want to earn your badge in? And you select. And the person will, you can't select unless you know. And then once you know, you can start working on um, improving that. Didn't you guys discuss a lot of we, gifts? We did, and a lot of times the, the gifts that I think were given, you don't realize until somebody says, you really have a gift for, and you go, really? Yes, yes. And then you can work on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what, what's happening when the Spirit comes in to a group? Well, that's one of the things I want to talk about now. Okay. We, we, we mentioned Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas specifically. They apparently were directly guided by the Holy Spirit. Go here, go there, do this, do that. You think the Holy Spirit would do that for us today? Well, if he did, how would he do that? I mean, how, how did you he get do it signal? back then? That's the question. How would you get the signal that this is from the Holy Spirit or something that you just come up with by yourself? Yeah. So, how and do you how do, do that? You no, know it's from the Holy Spirit instead of from somewhere else. Those who have recently in the church been involved with that that kind of thing they know the they know the voice that talks to them they know the angels that speak to them they've heard the voice they recognize them and it's a it's a it's a relationship that uh i only long for uh but it's something that's real and when they have it and they talk about it and they give you experiences that they go through uh it makes you realize that uh, something's missing. Yeah. It, well, it, missing. I remember. I remember when Maxwell used to talk about the spirit. He'd confound everybody. To how do you know for sure if that's really the spirit? It, it, you go the whole time asking people, "How would you know that?" And that, what you just explained, was brought up several times, but it didn't seem to to do everything needed. 
There are some Christian churches whose main emphasis is spiritual gifts. And they think that you're not even a Christian unless you have what they think are the most important spiritual gifts. Speaking in tongues, for example, and that sort of thing. You mean they limit it to one or two gifts? No, they, they would be happy for you to have any others, but you need to probably have that one too. They, so they've narrowed down some indicators, I think. Mm -hmm. And, they, it's, and you, if you follow those indicators, then, you, you're, okay. then you're okay. It's perceived as an indicator. So everybody okay. has to have one gift, but they can have an additional gift besides that? Mm, I don't know if they require everybody to have that gift, but they tend to look down on you if you don't have that gift. Now, in, 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 when, they, when they talk about that, they have certain formulas about, okay, you need to do this and this, and you'll get this gift. See, And they even formulas, okay, do it this way. This, do, 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 this is the way you do it. And um, I don't think that God doesn't want us to put him in a box in a box like that. Well, he's not predictable like that, I don't no. think. At least in my life, he's never been that when God, When God creates as many flowers as he does, I don't think you can put <laughs> him into one, make him a rose, and that's all. Uh -uh. Have you ever been invited to attend a spiritual gifts seminar? I've heard of them. You've heard of them. Well, you're way ahead of most of us. Oh dear, I went to a, a spiritual gifts seminar, yes, and I found out that it was a class in how to speak in tongues, and mm -hmm. they wanted you to develop your love language. And I didn't, they had no mention of that before you started the class. If there was a spiritual gifts seminar being held at your church or at a nearby Adventist church, would you attend? Depends who was teaching it. So you're already judging it, huh? <laughs> well, something about the teacher. Well, you know, there is such a thing called spiritualism, which yeah. is a different. And another thing called spiritual formation, which is different. L l look at these verses in 1 Corinthians 12. We're going to go back to 1 Corinthians 12 quite a few times. Start with verse 27. Again, he says, all of you are Christ's body, and each one is a part of it. In the church of God, uh, has, in the church, God has put all in, one, in place. In the first place, apostles. In the second place, prophets. In the third place, teachers. Then those who perform miracles, followed by those who give up, who are given the power to heal and to help others or to direct them, or to speak in strange tongues. They're not all apostles or prophets or teachers. Not everyone has the power to work miracles or to heal diseases or to speak in strange tongues or to explain what is said. Set your hearts then on the more important gifts. Okay, now, question. What are the more important gifts? Well, they may not be the sensational ones. Okay, I'm not setting any limits. I'm going to give you, <laughs> I'm giving you carte blanche. Okay, tell me which are the more important gifts. Think the Does he go on to say, give uh, 1 Corinthians 13 love? Yeah. The whole next, the next 13 verses, chapter 13, are all about Greatest love. Of these is love. Uh -huh. So I suppose if you had something that was a foreign gift, it would end up cheating you out in love somehow. Maybe. Yeah. Well, you know, Satan is a crafty character. And so all of these gifts, if you do them in love, they are God's way. But Satan will take every single gift God gave and think of a way that it can be used in selfishness and destruction. Mm -hmm. Is that why it's important to have love as the basis for all these gifts? No, let, let's, and I would say yes to that, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to keep us moving down in the direction our lesson goes. Oh, okay. Have you ever been called to use your spiritual gifts by your church? And if you were called to use your spiritual gifts, were you comfortable doing that? Did they ask you to, re to do it again the next year? Um, what did people tell you about your spiritual gifts? You have to find the, um, the pastor that is not scared to ask for the spiritual mm -hmm. gifts. <laughs> well, in a congregation of thousands of people, I don't think everybody is asked to use their spiritual gifts on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Okay. 
Do you mean when they ask you to join a ministry? A ministry or to do something? I mean, even even if you're even if your um, job is to ask you to, to be a deacon or something like that. Mm. Look at Acts 6, uh, the first four verses. It's an interesting story there. Acts 6. Sometime later, as the number of disciples kept growing, there was a quarrel between the Greek-speaking Jews and the native Jews. The native Jews would be which ones? What were they speaking? Aramaic. Mm -hmm. Aramaic. They were the ones who lived in Palestine. There were far more Greeks outside of Palestine who mostly spoke Greek. The Greek-speaking Jews claimed that their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of funds. I wonder how many times in the church there's been a fight over who's taking good care of the widows. You know, maybe we need more fights like that one, huh? Well, so the twelve apostles called the whole group of believers together and said, it is not right for us to neglect the preaching of God's word in order to handle finances. Now, they didn't mention widows, they mentioned finances. Mm -hmm. So then, brothers and sisters, choose seven men among you who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, and we will put them in charge of this matter. So what do they do? We ourselves then will give our full time to prayer and the work of preaching. The whole group was pleased with the apostles' proposal, so they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicolaus, a Gentile from Antioch who had earlier been converted to Judaism. The group presented them to the apostles who prayed and placed their hands on them. And so the work of God continued to spread. Okay, what does that tell us about how the whole spiritual gifts kind of business? Well, I wonder, do... Do you think we, we're really seeing the picture there of what's happening? I mean... <laughs> Say more. What do you mean? Well, um, what exactly... I can't get any pictures of, of you know, okay. people I, I, okay. who have gifts, spiritual gifts in certain things to be able to do uh, something. Um, okay, here, let, 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 me, let me paint the picture. If you read back in chapter 5 and so forth, in chapter 4, you would see that uh, the, the disciples had come together. Mm -hmm. They had many people, I mean thousands of people following. I don't know how many people. They would meet together in the temple every day. I know they had a specific place and other people came. And as they would meet together, they would eat together. They would share their means to purchase food, etc. And everybody would eat together. And under those circumstances, Part of the duty of the church was considered to be taking care of the poor, especially widows and orphans and things like that. Well, there were some who were Aramaic speaking, there were some who were Greek speaking, and the Greek speaking ones felt that their, their widows, their poor, were being cheated. They weren't being treated as well as the Aramaic speaking, the native widows. So that's how it happened. So, so when they picked the people to take care of that mm -hmm. problem, what were they looking at to say that they were full of the Spirit to, able, to be able to take care of that problem? Well, very good question. Um, they obviously, it's interesting that if you look at the names, they're all Greek or Latin names. Do you think they picked the men that were wise in money? They knew that they could Probably. handle money and that they were fair-minded? Or maybe they were very enthusiastic about the job, doing the job. That's also possible. What we see is, of course, we know that Stephen didn't survive too much longer. He gave that fantastic sermon, and then he was stoned. But both Stephen and Philip ended up being basically apostles instead of deacons. Where were their gifts? Were they good deacons? We don't... We don't basically have any, effort, any information about their being what they did as deacons. We sure have an inf plenty of information about what they did as apostles, we missionaries. We assume that they had great talents in both areas. Apparently. Apparently so. Well, we've already looked at part of Acts 2, 40 to 47, but look at the rest of it. Peter made his appeal to them with many other words. This is Acts 2, starting with verse 40 made his appeal to them, and with many other words he urged them, saying, Save yourselves from the punishment coming on the wicked, this wicked people. It's interesting how he spoke about the Jewish people who thought they were the saints. Many of them believed his message and were baptized, and about 
thousand people were out of the group that day. They spent their time in learning from the apostles, taking part in the fellowship, and sharing in the fellowship meals and the prayers. Many miracles and wonders were being done through the apostles, and everyone was filled with awe. All the believers continued together in close fellowship and sharing their belongings with one another. They would sell their property and possessions and distribute the money to among all according to what each one needed. Day after day they met as a group in the temple and they had their meals together in their homes, eating with glad and humble hearts, praising God and enjoying the good food, I'm sorry, enjoying the good will of all the people. And every day the Lord added to their group those who were being saved. They were probably sharing the good food too. Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine handling 3,000 new people a day? I mean... Um, and a place is not even yours. And, We're talking about the temple. It's hard to absorb that many people and get them trained. And so um, there had to be, the Holy Spirit had to be working in there. Well, somebody, somebody, if you told the story to enough people, would certainly raise this issue. In more modern times, church groups have gone out to poor areas in the world and started feeding poor people, starving children, etc., trying to heal people using modern techniques, etc., and so forth. And sometimes they've raised up huge churches. And then there's a, maybe a change in the government or something, or communism comes in or whatever, and the foreign missionaries have to leave, and suddenly the church goes, whoosh. And those people are sometimes called rice Christians. You think there are any rice Christians in the church in Jerusalem? Is the, the, it's possible. <laughs> the conditions were there for that to happen, that's for sure. I mean, when Jesus fed the 5,000, they kind of the same concept kind of happened there, didn't it? They, well, why, why were the deacons appointed? They were appointed to take care of the widows. So, you know, there was some welfare, quote-unquote, going on. Mm -hmm. They were taking care of people. So someone in need may have joined the group mm -hmm. without a spiritual calling. Well, or do you think that only those who are ordained or paid, let's say, by the church have been called? Because the church breaks up when the leaders leave and, and they were providing... Um, food and rice to the people. Mm -hmm. Just because they left doesn't mean that everybody lost their faith, but mm -hmm. they're in the poor country. No one had the leadership skills to keep mm -hmm. something together. They might have been meeting in their own homes, mm -hmm. um, you know, but... Um, w what is supposed to happen in, in our day? Uh, look at some examples. Look at Romans twelve four. We have many parts in the one body, and all these parts have different functions. Now, I said to this before, these gifts that are being given are supposed to produce a workable church body, okay? So we come to the next one, um, 1 Corinthians 12, 12. Christ is like a single body which has many parts. It is still one body even though it is made up of different parts. Don't we believe that? Ephesians 4, 6. There is all, one God and Father of all who is Lord of all, works through all, and is in all. Okay? Do you think it is God's responsibility to pull all the parts together and to get them working as one whole? Because I hardly know a group that functions smoothly on its own together. And it seems to me that God would pull His body together and get the parts working. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it's up to us, are we successful in getting all the parts working together? Well, there were notable times when individuals did important evangelistic, evangelistic things. We think of Philip in the, in the eunuch, in the Ethiopian in Acts 8, or, or Peter with Cornelius in Acts 10. But it's also true that these men were a part of a larger group, and they apparently functioned very well in the larger group. Mm. So... If we feel a little reluctant to get something started, maybe we need to be looking for a group. We'd be more comfortable functioning in a group. Well, actually, I don't, I, I'm wondering if a loner can do all that stuff. I mean, um, I think God gives people their talents 
mm -hmm. for the purpose of bringing them together. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you, if there was nothing to bring them together, why would they bring the, be brought together? I mean, you would just be a, a loner somewhere and wouldn't need anybody then. Mm -hmm. Now that Livingston guy that was out in Africa, was he a Christian? Yes, David Livingston. Okay, and, and he was a loner, Scotland, right? from Scotland. Was he a loner or did Pretty he much. have a group? Well, there's there were some people that sponsored him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's that's still kind of he needed somebody okay. to go forward on that. So and even when he went into the the bush or wherever, um he he was putting together groups, mm -hmm. wasn't he? Yeah. So okay. so um we, we've already we've already seen how different groups like for example Paul was guided he was told, no, don't go north into Bithynia. I want you to go across into Europe. And we're, we should be very thankful, all of us who are of European stock, that Paul headed that direction because it seemed to me that's the way the Christian church spread. Um, did Paul receive a specific, specific vision from God that gave him direction? Look at Acts 16, 9 and 10. That night, Paul had a vision in which he saw a Macedonian standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. As soon as Paul had this vision, we got ready to leave for Macedonia because we decided that God had called us to preach the good news to the people there. Now, God could have just given Paul an impression. He could have just said to Paul, go. He could have given Paul a lot of directions. I want you to go there and I want you to do this, da, 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 da. What did think, he do? Do you think that happens today? It seems like it happened more in the Bible in the past. That, that there were people were miraculously called? Yeah, that God yeah, gives a vision. Sort of dream or, mm -hmm. or something fell out of the tree and pointed this way <laughs> or something like that. Um, uh -huh. so, well, you know, when people do that, you kind of wonder about them. <laughs> there are also right places now. in Acts where... Paul, or the writing says, we, we were prevented from going to such and such a place. How were they prevented? Was mm -hmm. there illness, or was there a storm, or was there a vision, or was it a riot? What was it? Yeah. Well. Everything's um, providential, I guess. Well, that's one of the other ways in which we sometimes feel we're led. Circumstances. You know, we talk about doors opening and doors closing and so forth. They're not literal doors. So how can we be sure that this impression that we're getting or this door that's opening is the Holy Spirit and not the devil? Can the devil give impressions? Oh, yes. Yeah? Even temptations, can't he? You could, you could test the idea. Yeah? You could talk to people about it and say, and even talk about their impression that mm -hmm. they think is from God. One See thing we can say. okay yeah. One thing we we can be reasonably certain about and that's that God will not choose one person somewhere and lead that person off in a different direction away from anybody else who's being led by the, by the spirit. God doesn't primarily promote a lot of divisions. So like Paul and Barnabas. <laughs> Well, <laughs> well, it's it was still providential, I guess. Maybe God didn't yeah. promote that. Maybe it was the devil, and God made the best use of it in spite of uh, them splitting up. Saul was being divided mm -hmm. from the Jews, mm -hmm. but he was being divided to follow Jesus. So God, Abraham was called from his family mm -hmm. to follow God. Okay. So I think you have to evaluate is this leading in a godly direction? Yes, fair enough. Well, in order to best involve people with the right spiritual gifts, talking about how we might plan things, talking about direction, when it is time to consider starting some new program in the church, should we begin with the training seminar? And then have you ever been invited to, to a spiritual gifts training seminar? Are you aware of a variety of spiritual gifts that have been manifested in your church already? Is there a core group in your church that are dedicated in praying for a greater infilling of the Holy Spirit? So, you know, how, and, and let's follow along. Often we say, well, we really need to do thus and so in our church. Okay, let's do it. Now let's pray for the Lord to bless us. 
right? After we've made up our mind. After we let's have an eye. Let's pray for guidance. Yes. We want a stamp of approval. Yeah. Well, what would happen if we asked God, the God to guide us and we, we, we offered to do what he wanted us to do? How would you know that it's what God yeah. would want you to do? Mm-hmm. Well, there's a couple of comments from Ellen White. God has set in the church different gifts. These are precious in their proper places, and all may act a part in the work of preparing a people for Christ's soon coming. Ellen White, Gospel Workers, page 481. All may act a part in preparing a people for the end. All men do not receive the same gifts, but to every servant of the Master, some gift of the Spirit is promised. Christ's Object Lessons, page 327. So, should the church, should we, should we have um, a weekend of fasting and prayer and say, guide us, Lord, show us what you want us to do? Would that be a fair way to do it? Mm-hmm. Have you ever tried that? No. No? Well, not, I haven't organized it myself, if that's what you're talking about. I've been involved one time, but I have more I, than once. With. I think people are scared to say, God, <clears throat> you lead me into what you want me to do. And they're afraid they're going to be led to go to Timbuktu or something like that. I was led to go to East Africa. Uh-huh. You know, Beyond there Timbuktu. A, there, there was a job I always hated, but that was washing dishes. Mm-hmm. I used to wash dishes over at my grandmother's nursing home yeah. all the time. I hated that. And I always was worried that God would call me to go somewhere and wash dishes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, I, 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 I can I can I can speak to that because when I was a freshman in boarding school, boarding academy, um, they just told us in advance everybody will be given a job. Everybody does work; that's a part of their education. I showed up and they sent me down to the lady in charge of the kitchen, and she says, "For this year, it will be your responsibility to wash dishes for." 300 students, three meals a day. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> now, there, there, was, there, were, there, there, were, there were four or five of us. Some, sometimes there's only two of us doing the dishes for the whole meal. That reminds me a little bit of, we've been doing interviews for a residency, and mm-hmm. we get, we've had some applicants from China. Mm-hmm. And they said, you know, at the end of medical school, you know, I was top in the class or this and that. And I was assigned to this program. I didn't, that's not what I wanted, but I was assigned. Sounds like you were assigned to dishes. I was. Rather than looking for your talents. Yes. Some of, the, some of these guys were talented in neurology. Some of them were talented in uh, surgery. Some were talented in something else. And they were sent to, you know, ophthalmology. Mm-hmm. Is that what God does, is assign us? Well, that's the question. Do, or do we pick the program and then we say, God, please bless us to do what we want to do? Well, is it something in between? Hmm. Or does he give us the gifts and let us find where we're supposed to be? And what? Sometimes those hmm. things just are presented to us. When I hmm. moved out here to go to work at the hospital many years ago, they gave us options and they said, put your first three choices down and I want to do surgical ICU. That was what I wanted to do. Hmm? Mm-hmm. No. 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 I ended up in cardiology, which was, if I had gone the other way, it would have been awful. You know, but I didn't know that at the time. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I think God uses our choices to guide us in the direction. Okay. Let me, let me, again, throw a monkey wrench into the story here. If we really, let's say we had a weekend of fasting and prayer to try to say, okay, God, what would you like us to do in the way of personal witnessing, evangelism in this church? Let's just say we did it like that. And God gave us some directions so that we could start a program. Would this possibly cause a breadbasket upset in the church? I mean, maybe the people who would be chosen as leaders following their spiritual gifts aren't the people who are leaders now. Might be good. Well, that's what happened in the Christian church. The, Jew, the Jews had their leaders all set, and uh, Christ came and upset the apple cart, and his apostles became leaders of 
this new church. Mm -hmm. and so maybe God does that. God does do that. Would be we be willing to accept the job that yeah. we were given? Yeah, if, if um, the, church, the pastor helps to organize a weekend like that and then someone else has chosen to lead out, would that be a problem? I don't think in this particular church structure that can happen. Okay. In the Adventist church structure, or our structure are you talking about our local church? Yeah, because the pastors are paid. Mm -hmm. So... Um, well, none of us get paid and we're doing something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just because they're paid doesn't mean they're the best ones either. Um. <laughs> well, considering what we have studied so far in three lessons, how would you answer the question, why does the Holy Spirit give spiritual gifts? For the promoting of Christ's work. Okay. I mean, shouldn't he just say, Jim has a natural talent and Gordon has another talent and we just use those natural talents that they have. Go what's ahead. the, what's the difference be. between the natural talent yeah. and a gift? Sorry, That's go my go question. Exactly. I, I don't think there is a difference. You know, I will take exception to that. I think there are certain people that are put in situations where they learn how, how to mm -hmm. do something and they do it well, but it really isn't, you know, what they wanted to do, but they've learned to do it very well and they enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Well, so. apparently... People can do music real well and others can't. Yeah. <laughs> apparently... So kind of inherited. That, that becomes very obvious. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> apparently, we need some guidance. Uh-huh. Um, I think without the Holy Spirit, we're probably living in a vacuum, aren't we? Mm -hmm. So that would be my answer. Well, surely we, it would be obvious to all of us, even just thinking about it, that the Holy Spirit doesn't give, give gifts for us to just waste. He intends for us to use them. For a purpose. Mm -hmm. He, not, he does not give gifts, I don't believe, primarily for us to use for our own benefit. I mean, does the Holy Spirit give one person the capacity to make a lot of money, for example? But does the Holy Spirit give a gift and then the individual run off and do something else with it? Yeah, there was yeah. that prophet that beat the donkey and wasn't he misusing God's gift of prophecy? <laughs> Misusing God's donkey, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, he had a hidden agenda, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah, not so hidden, even. Well, do you know anyone who has a spiritual gift who does not want to share it? Does not want to use it? Maybe someone who doesn't feel confident or very shy, but I've never met an, a stubborn Christian that I can think of. Mm. <laughs> okay. <Really? laughs> okay. You may not have been around long <laughs> enough. <laughs> been around this table. <laughs> <laughs> well, when Jesus was born, the Magi brought him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We all know this story. There's were, these were kingly gifts brought by wise men. You know, just take it. We got a moment. Look at Matthew 2, 11. They went into the house. This is where Joseph and Mary and the child were staying at that point. And when they saw the child with his mother Mary, they knelt down and worshipped him. They brought out their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh and presented them to him. By the way, what were those gifts used for? For traveling. Those burial. What? Well, are those used for... Burial. Uh, well, I mean, this particular bunch of gifts. Here's Joseph and Mary. They're poor people. And all of a sudden, they've oh, got... they got to go to Egypt. And yeah, it was used for helping to take, order. pay their expenses for going to Egypt and doing everything they needed to do down there. It was yeah. a very important thing. So just like God, when he, he had the Jews come out of uh, captivity, and they came out rich with the wares so that they could be prepared for life, he had Joseph and, and building Mary... building a sanctuary. And he had Joseph and Mary give, brought these gifts that then supported their passage, their expenses. Were those gifts that were normally given to a king? Yes. Were any of those part of the gifts that Mary 
when she broke the alabaster box, what was in that? No, that was uh, a different. Um, see, what does it name specific? It says rich perfume. Nard was supposed to be. Uh, I, I'm not sure what nard is, but. Mm. Those well, so, yeah. So, what do these gifts, how are you aligning them with the Well, tribute? for two millennia since then, people have been called from ordinary lives and even from paganism to become part of God's royal priesthood. You remember the way we're, what we're called for, 1 Peter 2 9. But you are the chosen race, the king's priest, the holy nation, God's own people, chosen to proclaim the wonderful acts of God who called you out of darkness into his own marvelous light. So we will be right now focusing on chosen to proclaim the wonderful acts of God. You know, these three wise men that were chosen to proclaim Jesus' birth with these gifts, they weren't Jews, they weren't Christians, they were completely different mm -hmm. types of people. Mm -hmm. So God calls people to declare his glory that are not of... Amazing, huh? Not of one religion yeah. or... uh huh. Now, God doesn't call us just to blindly follow along. As God's royal priest kings, we are to bring a new kind of gift to the service of the church. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh change in value or may even lose their value completely under certain circumstances. But spiritual gifts, gifts of mercy, healing, teaching, prophecy, and leadership, when used correctly under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, not only grow and become more effective, but may also be added to by the additional spiritual gifts. The Holy Spirit often gives more talents to people who use them properly. How are you doing with your royal priesthood role? When you became a Christian, were you invited to discover your spiritual gifts and to use them for the benefit of the larger church body? No. <laughs> no. I was with one lady who was baptized along with me, and she was actually saying the gifts that she wanted. Mm. She was starting to say, I want this gift and this gift. Oh boy. Almost um, encouraging know, the Holy Spirit that, that she wanted something. Mm -hmm. when you, when you, these gifts are always something that are extraordinary, right? They're, they come from the Spirit. But Paul, we read the verse where Paul says, seek earnestly the best gifts. What does that mean? Seek the best. Seek the gifts. But, but there's always these gifts that are associated with the Holy Spirit, though. And so th yeah. they have something special. Mm -hmm. Now, when this happens in the church, do the opposites of those gifts get given to somebody else through the other side? Because it seems mm -hmm. like when this grows up, that something then attacks it, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's pretty big itself. Yeah. So I wonder if, if... Is the devil at work? Yes. If, if he's at work, if the Lord pours out the Holy Spirit on people, is it possible that Satan is able to pour his spirit Absolutely. on some other people? And there seems to be kind of a tit for tat mm -hmm. type I'd of thing. I'd flip it the happening. other way around. Satan is going to use his force, his miracles, all the power that he can. And God has to provide his miracles to counter it. Well, it could be the other way around, too. It depends on... Well, pay your money, take your choice. Well, okay. First Peter 4.10 Each one, as a good manager of God's different gifts, must use for the good of others the special gift he has received from God. Whoever preaches must preach God's messages. Whoever serves must serve with the strength that God gives so that in all things praise may be given to God through Jesus Christ to whom belong glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Okay? So whether we have the gift of teaching or preaching or kindness and mercy, mm -hmm. we need to use it to the fullest yeah. Not be ashamed of it. Okay, here's a, ch here's a challenging question. In our seeking for the spiritual gifts and trying to use our spiritual gifts, do we value diversity? You know, Paul made quite a deal out of the fact we can't all be eyes. Some, we need some ears, we need some hands, we need feet. But everybody wants to be the pitcher. Hmm. On the ball team. 
Oh, yes. it's just like a community. Somebody needs to be the blacksmith. Somebody needs to yeah. be the the one that takes care of the horses, <laughs> yeah. the watering person, the well digger, the the carpenter. Um, you need all those people to, to put together a community. Mm -hmm. Well, at our right. high school, we always used to call the office staff and the custodians the grease that kept the wheels on the uh, cart. Mm -hmm. Without them, we were helpless. Mm -hmm. Well, when the Christian church was first starting, members came together not only to share their spiritual gifts and vigorously and actively evangelize, but also they shared the material goods, act actually living and eating together as a way to serve Him would God ever call us into some kind of communal living? Are our outreach activities such as fellowship dinners and church potlucks a modern manifestation of this idea? I suspect that when you can't buy or sell, God's people will be in little groups and it'll be pretty communal. And the hospitality people who are doing potluck often pray for God to bless the loaves and fishes that they s go far enough for all the people that are coming. And we mm -hmm. see miracles every week as they uh, somehow the food stretches. So mm -hmm. while you're in ministry, you do see things happen along the way. Well, now that we've spent some time discussing how to discover your spiritual gifts and how spiritual gifts can be used to build up the church, and that is its main function, is it clear to you what the differences are between spiritual gifts and natural abilities? We mentioned that just a moment ago. Do we, when we join the church, maybe let's say at the age of somewhere between 12 and 15 or something like that, do we get new gifts at that point in time? Get new talents? Well, does it sometimes seem like some individuals have many, more nat have many natural abilities and perhaps many spiritual gifts, while others have few? How can we prevent this from be be becoming an area of contention? Have you wished that you could become more involved in some exciting church program that actually produced results? Have you thought about ways that you could cooperate with others to make it happen? What are we waiting for? God promised, He says, I will be with you, the Holy Spirit will be with us. We ought to be praying for this to happen in every Adventist church in the world. Go home and try it.